Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you once again for attending and watching this presentation with uh, Colonel Darren Ninnis and me, Colonel Stan Scrabbit. I'm the Director of Recruiting and Retention in the Northeast region. Darren, if you'd be so kind to introduce yourself. I'm the uh, National Director of, or actually National uh, Recruiting and Retention Manager for Civil Air Patrol. Rock on. Tonight we have a wonderful presentation. At least we believe it's wonderful. We, we put a little bit of our heart and soul into this. So just to let you know, we have a um, few ways that you can communicate with us. All right. So this is, this is going to be a lot of one way. We're going to give you a lot of information. But if you got questions, it, on your screen, I think up in the upper right hand corner of the video window gives you an opportunity to ask questions. We will be monitoring those questions. Also, if you are out there in Twitterverse, you can use Twitter to ask us questions, and that would be a hashtag CAP recruiting, and that would let you uh, communicate with us. You can also use the chat function on the Google Plus page that we have. Uh, lots of ways to communicate with us. We are here to serve you. Um, we think we are putting together a good program. And uh, at the end of this, we will be announcing our next presentation. And Colonel Ninnis will uh, provide us with the date when that comes around. Um, and then also one other thing is on the 10th of March, we are giving a presentation, an introduction to Civil Air Patrol for all those folks that don't know what Civil Air Patrol. We, I've been kind of beating the bushes, but what I'm hoping that you do as recruiting and retention officers, you go beat the bushes too, send them to this presentation. We're going to talk about aerospace education, the cadet program, and emergency services, kind of give them an intro to CAP and point them back to you. So help us out and do that. Anything you want to add, Colonel Ninnis, before we jump into this? Uh, no, sir. Actually, I've got the date wound up, and I'll uh, share that at the end. Very good. Thank you. All right. Well, let's get started. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and um, we're going to have a good time here. Colonel Ninnis, can you see my screen? I can. Very good. All right. I am going to make this primary and we're going to go. So what we're talking about here today is we have members coming into the CAP and then after a very short time, they are leaving the program. And the big question is, what can we do about it? Okay. <clears throat> Whoops. Let me go. Let's get to the right place. Story of my life. Okay. So you are in a local CAP squadron, right? We're down in the bread and butter. We're at the unit level. You are in a squadron. You are, I'm going to say this, a recruiting and retention officer in Civil Air Patrol. Your, your focus is to bring and keep members into the program. What we're finding out is we're getting a lot of members to come see our program, but then they're leaving only one or two years into, you know, into their membership. What we want to do is we want them to renew. We want them to continue their membership for many, many years. What we're going to do, our job, Colonel Ninnis and I, we are going to explain to you why people are leaving and give you some ideas on how you can keep them here. Okay. So there's, there's a lot of work that goes into this. It's not just, it, there's no magic formulas here. So, Let's start out with the senior members. Here are some of the top reasons why senior members are leaving Civil Air Patrol. And we're going to share ideas on how we can possibly keep them. OK, so first of all, the biggest number one reason that we are seeing why members are leaving Civil Air Patrol is they do not feel their time and talents are needed or valued. So we bring in members and we ignore them or we consider them 
not capable because they don't understand the CAP way. For example, we have some individuals, uh, and a story was just passed on to me. We have uh, a, an individual out there who is the CEO of a company that has a couple hundred members, uh, employees, part of their company, and at the local unit, they wanted to share some of the lessons they learned in running a company with millions of dollars. And our membership said, well, you know, you're just a second lieutenant. What the heck are we doing? Okay, so to get this off right, started off right, one of the things that we need to do is really sit down with the individuals and give them a good orientation to our program before we even make them members. Point out the expectations. Take time to explain that they got to go through level one. Here's what it's, it takes in order for them to become uh, full-fledged pilots in our program and that it may take time to do this. Okay, but, but if they're looking for a quick fix and we don't have it, we need to let them know that up front. So we've got to talk about our programs and the fact that when we do this, we have to also personally buy into the program. We have regulations. We have documentation that we need to do. And if we go out there and moan and groan about how, how miserable this is, what kind of impression are we making on other people, right? We need to do this, and the reason we do some of these things is because we are obligated or beholden to our taxpayers, right? They give us funds to do this, and we have to show accountability back. So we need to be clear about this up front. Another thing that you can do to help out is have a member come to a couple meetings before they sign the application. Don't just shove an application into their hands. I'm reading a wonderful book right now by a guy named Pat Flynn. It's called Will Will It Fly? And basically what he's doing is going through a whole program to sh teach you how to sell an object, a product, a service. And a big part of that is you need to communicate and build trust before someone comes in, okay? Because if you burn that trust, you're going to not only lose that person, but a lot of other people. So let's be upfront with the expectations, have them come in, see what the program is about, what kind of training that we provide, um, things like this. Don't sell them sense of false goods. <clears throat> also in bringing them in, try to dovetail what it is that they are interested in doing and what our program can do and try to figure out that marriage, okay? Try to accommodate what their interests are, what their needs are, and put those things together. Another reason that people leave, they don't have enough time to commit to CAP because they've got other obligations. They belong to other organizations. They have family commitments. They have work commitments that they're just busy. People today are much busier than they were 20 years ago. Okay, It's just the nature of how our world works right now. They're busy. But what can we do, right? We, we understand the program. So the first thing is, is don't just stack a bunch of regulations in front of them and say, here, you're the guy, boom, go figure it out. Uh, it's your program, run with it. Let's figure out how we can leverage some help um, and give them maybe only pieces of the program at a time, train them up properly uh, instead of overwhelming them from the start. Give them assistance. What are we doing with our cadets? Um, we have cadet officers out there that part of their duties in the specialty tracks or in the, the staff duty analysis is to learn how to do these various duties. Marry them up with a senior member, give them something meaningful to do. Uh, the cadets will appreciate that. Understand their cadets, you know, things fall through the cracks with uh, cadets, but try to make that marriage um, 
and, and try to really figure out what a senior member is able to give and let's not try to overwhelm them you know by giving them too much especially when they're not ready it's it takes a lot more to do a task when you don't know how to do it when you're just training up than if you then when somebody is trained as as a member who has been in for since 1975 there are things I can do in my sleep in this program but for a new member it takes them a lot longer it, it's it's more of a burden because of all what they have to learn not everybody you know I would rather turn somebody away from the program if it's not a right fit than to find out that, that much later so the idea of getting the right people on the right bus is is you know as a, a commander in the program you need to set the vision you know that that we need to be talking from the top down from colonel vasquez through the region commanders through the wing commanders down to the group commanders down to the squadron commanders there has to be kind of the same vision and, and everybody has to be rowing in the same direction and this is what you need to communicate to the membership and either they buy in or they don't so when you're trying to get somebody new into the program you need to point out what this vision is but then the other part is getting them into the right seats okay <clears throat> there's a lot of people who would like to continue doing what they normally do in work also in a volunteer program but there's also an equal amount of people who want to do something different but immediately is like what do you do at work oh well I'm gonna make you do that here well nobody really wants you know I, I not everybody not everybody wants to do what they do at work for fun so you know let's listen to what our members say and try to accommodate them in their wishes you know and that may be you know helping out multiple assistants and this ties very much into matching duty assignments to what a member can give what their availability is that you know if they can only do a small piece of the the puzzle then let's let them do that because that alleviates somebody else from doing it okay and as things change we need to be open to making those adjustments Okay. <clears throat> I have to say in 40 years of Civil Air Patrol that, you know, and I may have been personally guilty at times, that did not provide the best leadership. And as a result, drove some people away. Okay. Hopefully I've gotten smarter, but we still have people out there that think that... It, how do I say this? That uh, the military aspects of our program, um, we have some folks that think it's it's Heartbreak Ridge all the way, and as a result, are really annoying other people who are competent leaders and who who would be willing to follow somebody who was competently leading the program. We need to continuously train in our program to develop our leadership capability, our management capability, and our technic technology capability. We need to continue figuring out how to do it the best way. And that involves all the people in our organization. And it is not a dictatorship where somebody just says, you're doing it my way or the highway. Because people walk. They walk right out of our doors because they don't need this. Okay, so I, I look and I, I continuously see it across our program where people are treated rudely and I'm not sure exactly what what the people in the leadership position are are trying to gain from this. Okay, as a recruiting and retention officer, one of your job is to advise your commander specifically in this idea of, of human um, human resources, HR, the HR capability. HR is responsible for hiring. It's ensuring that people are competent, that they, you know, they help with the idea of training, getting the right people in the right jobs, 
this is this is a role for recruiting and retention you know so part of it is bringing people in the door let's make sure that we get a right fit but the other thing is keeping them in there and you know as a recruiting and retention officer you need to look out for those things that are that are irking our members that are that are causing them to stay away from the program and sound the alarm and make sure that uh, the commander's aware of it and that there's a fix being put in place so we're just not pushing people out the door. So this is what I'm saying. If you see a negative trend, you need to respond. You need to sound the alarm. You need to get the attention um, of the commanders and have some adult conversations in the unit to have people better work together um, to get the mission done, okay? Otherwise, we're just pushing people out the door, okay? <clears throat> I think this is absolutely critical to our program. We need to constantly pull our membership together after we do something and have a good after action review. And very simply, you know, the, the easiest after action reviews that I've seen are you go around the room to every single member and they are required to answer. And I would go three times around the room on what did we do right? And we would chart these and document them and use them to, you know, kind of continue to for improvement, but also go around the room three times to each person and say, what could we have done better? Um, and it's really important to check the egos at that point in time. Um, and, and the initial ones are kind of fluffy, but as you do these on a regular basis, people get are aware of what's going on and there is great opportunity for program improvement. This is very common. We have a lot of folks that join because their child joined and became a cadet. The cadet got older or smelled the fumes and left. And now this other member is, you know, basically going to follow them. Okay. Well, we didn't do our job right if we just brought them in to be a parent of a cadet. And that's all we did. So what we need to do is we need to engage that that parent as a full-fledged member and as a unique member and get them into the response the right responsibilities. They are not just there to be a chaperone. Let's get them into meaningful activities where they're they're recognized, they're rewarded, they're feeling that the program is rewarding. Um and there's a greater chance they stay, that they, they find themselves as an essential part of the cog. But if we just consider them, well, you know, the, they're just a parent and, you know, and we write them off because we know the cadet left, then we're not going to keep them. We need to make sure that we follow the core values in Civil Air Patrol, and one of them is respect, is we respect everyone as individuals and get them totally bought into the program, that they are essential to the unit, and we recognize them for that and constantly um, cheerlead that activity. Okay, The other part of this is you know, which goes into that kind of pigeonholing that that we get a lot of members in and we we kind of stuff them over to the cadet programs because that they're there to sort of babysit the cadet uh, that they brought in. But what we really need to do is we need to get them in these other opportunities, get them into a glider flight, get them as part of an air crew, get them to to participate you know at encampment and or a special activity get them involved fully into this program get them into leadership roles um, to help our program okay <clears throat> and also help move them through for example professional development or es qualifications 
right? The more that somebody has invested into the program, the harder it is for them to leave. That you don't want to throw away all this time that you devoted to a program. You get them in there and, you know, start working them through, you know, ES qualifications and make them mission essential. And probably the biggest thing about the ES is we need to break up these clicks. That we have these clicks that are made up of, you know, these uh, mission staffs, you know, they don't want to work with anyone else. Or these air crews that, you know, we're only putting these guys, you know, into the air to, to keep them happy. I'm sorry, if everyone is paying their dues, we need to rotate this. If somebody is qualified to be an IC, we need to rotate through all the qualified ICs as missions come up. And, and the planning section chiefs and the ground teams, you know, instead of going and cherry picking and going to the, our favorites because we always do. Um, I saw that in, in the last wing that I worked in and we kind of blew that up. I would go on a rotating basis, you know, as a wing commander to choose my ICs. So everybody that was qualified had a chance to do it. And that made a huge difference because, you know, we were seeing the same one or two, even though I had five or six qualified. So we need to, to, to keep training them up, get in, in moving forward in professional development. This is a biggie too. We can drag out processes like no one's mind, okay? Members want to join, you know, because we promised them flying. You can come fly for us, right? And then they haven't been in the air for a year. We need to change that. So one, we still have the documentation to do, you know, and there's still training that needs to be done, but we can get a lot smarter on how we do this, um, you know, and be in, in part of the process, right? We need to we need to get these members actively involved, okay? So the first piece is let's not drag out the level one process. Um, a level one should not take longer than a month to complete. Matter of fact, it should not take longer than two weeks. You need to, you know, as a unit, you need to basically get somebody to mentor these new members and ride herd on them to get them through that that program. If they're stuck, unstuck them. Stan? Yes, sir. Uh, you know, a point here on the, on the level one process is, you know, my units had great success with the whole uh, cohort recruiting process. And we've even done it with senior members where, you know, we bring a number of senior members in and we train them all at once and we train them over a short period of time. Um, I don't know about two weeks. Uh, I, I understand where you're coming from there, but certainly you want You don't want to drag that out. Everybody says, oh, level one can last six months. No, don't fool around. Get these people in, get them trained and get them on to other things. Absolutely. Because you can't do anything with that member. They can't hold the duty position. They can't get promoted. They can't wear, you know, I mean, there's so many things that a member cannot do who's paid their money because they haven't done this level one. Get them through it, right? And the next thing is get them in the air, right? If they've come to fly, get them in the air. It could be a member of a transport mission, right? Doing a B, a B-12 mission, get them in the air, let them ride crew, you know, there's things that pilots do to kind of coach each other up in the air, right? I understand that, okay? But they want it, they're there because they want to fly. Let's get them flying, right? You know, they can ride, they can be part of a crew, right? To learn about our aircraft as soon as their level one is done. As soon as the, you know, the ink doesn't even have to be dry. They can get up in the air. Let's get them there. Goes back to the same thing with the level one, but get them a mentor that can get them through their training um, as fast as possible, right? What we, what I have experienced and watched in Civil Air Patrol for years is a new member comes to fly. They don't know the process. They don't know that, oh, maybe I should go ask somebody. They don't even know who to ask, but we do. So let's assign them to the right person, get your ops officer to track this and make sure that they are getting assigned to the right people 
and get them up there and flying and moving forward on their training what they need to do to get signed off in a qualification so they can be a full-fledged member or get through their form five whatever it takes let's get that moving and that requires maybe us making the phone calls and not necessarily them the new guy who doesn't know anyone okay uh, last place drove me crazy watching this that you know guys that that wanted to fly left because we weren't getting them in the air at all <sighs> things change right people's interests kind of go by the wayside over time they're no longer in cap what can we do about that okay i mean the reality is is things change but what we need to do is kind of keep our finger on the pulse we need to frequently survey our members get get that information back into planning of activities and have those members also participate in the planning process right if they're involved you know they have this increased buy-in to our program so we need to kind of kind of keep an eye out and i would recommend you know just asking these everything from a one-on-one -on -one conversation to a full-fledged survey that you're sending to your membership or you know from a wing level sending it to your membership let's go ahead and ask these questions you know are we doing what our membership is hoping that we will <clears throat> quite often that i i see a couple people going into the back room and they come out and say this is our plan i, I would change that i would recommend that you have you know say a whole meeting cadets and senior members dedicated to sitting down in the planning process on what you're going to put on to your activities for the upcoming year or quarter um, get everybody's suggestions uh, look at the the e-services reports and do goal setting across the organization you know um, you know at the squadron level get everybody's input on what they want to do um, do some research look at what every member needs talk to that member you know are they interested in doing this and 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 pull all this information together as part of your planning process so you're attending to the needs of your members okay we have a mission to fulfill and i totally get that but we can't fulfill the mission if we do not have members and this comes down to we need to have a balance between what the members want and are interested in doing and you know what national and the air force wants us to do and between that we're going to get the mission done okay but we can't do it without the people okay communicate 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 with your folks right um i've been in some organizations that i've heard nothing crickets right we don't know what's going on and you know if nobody's communicating why am i sticking around i don't know what's going on we need to communicate as much as possible what things are coming up um where are opportunities and you, you got to know your membership try to cherry pick you know an activity and and run into those people that need that activity and and try to get that marriage together Right? It's kind of a dating service. I have an activity, I have a person, put them together, uh, marriage made in heaven. But we do this by communicating, having a newsletter. There is a tool, right? For one of the first things I did coming on board as the region recruiting and retention officer is I fired up this program called MailChimp. For every single organization we have in Civil Air Patrol, uh, except maybe for some of the wings some some wings are pretty large but but basically for most of them you could use MailChimp like crazy to put out a newsletter to even just a, a regular email and get it to your entire membership letting them know what kind of activities all for free okay the cool thing about it is I can also tell you 
what the open rate is. And I can tell you if the individual opened it. So um, a, lot of, a lot of power there. And part of that is with MailChimp, if you break it up into the segments and, you know, there's links in it, I can tell you which links that people are, have gone to, what the open, the click through rate is on that. So you can find out what people are interested in or put your survey right in there. Okay. This is a, this is a common one. People, you know, stick around for a year, decide to leave, or they don't even stick around a year. They stick around for a couple months. I had members actually give me an application. I never saw them again. Okay. They came for the first three meetings, gave an application, never saw them again. Um, and, and I didn't see any police reports either. So they just disappeared. Okay. Um, but basically it wasn't what CAP, what they thought CAP was about. So that makes me ask the question, why? Why didn't, why, what did we do wrong there? <clears throat> so basically, in some cases, we're selling rainbows and unicorns. Everything is just perfect in CAP. Um, you know, that we have these, these international trips as a cadet, you can go on one of those. Um, we can have you flying in fighter jets and, yeah, we have those programs, but they are way down the line. And that's, we keep selling, selling things that they, we don't do in the squadron. So we need to do this. And I, and I hear Colonel Ninnis ready to just prounce all over the rainbows and unicorns. Oh yeah. You know, it's, it's a big important thing. And this is particularly with cadets too, but um, you know, sell the program we've got too many times we talk about the, 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 the flash, the things that you can do two years, three years, four years from now. And yeah, that's great. In particular with cadets, their event horizon is so short. They don't, they don't want to hear that. So make sure you're selling what we've got, sell them the organization, you know, because if, if they come in and you say, Oh yeah, we do search and rescue and we're great. And we're awesome. We're going to be saving lives in like the next 10 or 15 minutes. And then they, spend six months doing training and they're like, yeah, I never got a phone call. Not interested. Yeah. I would like to add on that. Never got a phone call. This goes back to, we get people trained up and qualified in certain positions and never call them. We always call the same people. Once again, you know, this kind of ties in, right? So we, we have to do honest marketing, you know, um, Military recruiters got a bad rap because they'd promise you, oh, sure, you want to be in the military band? I can hook you up, okay? Um, but when you signed the papers, it was entirely different. So we're, we should not be doing that. One of the things, and this can be tough, you know, because we don't ever go talk to our members when they leave us, right? But really we could be doing ourselves a lot of uh, favors if we did exit interviews with people who left Civil Air Patrol. So um, one, one thing at the region level, I'm trying to figure out a good way to make that happen. But I would definitely like to know why people are leaving the program um, and what we can do better. And at, probably down to the squadron level, you, you need to figure out a way to conduct exit interviews and, and talk to your members. Yes, sir. Stan, an important thing to keep in mind, a lot of people don't realize this, but you know, most members who leave Civil Air Patrol, they don't leave in the last 90 days. You know, a lot of folks say, oh, you should, you should wait until the last 90 days and then do a retention interview. This isn't like the National Guard or the military where you're, you're there all the way until the last day. Um, most people who leave the organization tend to do it, you know, at the six month, eight month mark, they're gone well before that 90 day mark and you know you need to pay attention to who's participating and where they are you can't stand there and say hmm i haven't seen ted for six months i wonder if he's still active here's a hint if you haven't seen ted for six months you're probably not doing a very good job of keeping track of your people and leading your people right on okay <clears throat> once again this goes back and trying to connect back to their initial interest in the program. 
you should figure out, you know, electronically. I, I use Google, you know, Gmail, and probably everybody that's, a, you know, in my squadron was a contact in, in Gmail. And I can keep notes on those people in Gmail, you know, under contacts. I can keep notes, you know, and those notes are searchable. So, you know, however you do it, figure out a way to capture what their interests were and use that to get them into the program, into doing what they are interested in doing to help the organization, okay? That's, if they're not doing what they came to do, then they're leaving. People are bored, right? We don't have activities. I don't understand this because we have the capability and everything that we need to do to have activities and um, nobody should be bored, right? But we, we don't, we don't leverage this smartly. Okay. So, you know, and I, and I, you know, I, I came out of Wyoming and that, that kind of tough because you had 10, you know, we had 10 squadrons spread across the, the 10th largest state and it was really hard. You, you couldn't do everything you know, things every weekend and bring people together and the units were very small, just barely, you know, squadron size, you know, so it made it challenging. But now I live up in the Northeast region and I'm a stone's throw from four organizations. Why those four organizations collectively don't talk to each other and figure out programming that you could almost have some, you definitely could have something once a month, but twice a month, you know, whether it's, it's public affairs training, logistics training, uh, finance training. I mean, I can go through all the specialty tracks. Then let's talk about air crew training that we for scanners and observers and mission pilots and ground team members and ground team leaders and mission staff, um, all that training. And then you have aerospace and, various cadet leadership, you cannot tell me that there is not enough to keep our missions going and that we cannot saturate our calendar with activities that members can, you know, different members of our organization can't go to. So part of this is, you know, and this is really aimed at the recruiting retention officers is putting together a good retention plan and really this retention plan is is almost an activities plan uh, part of it is you know your communication plan on how you are going to interact with your members to make sure that all their needs are met on the other half you're going to feed this into your activities plan to make sure you have activities that are meeting the the members needs and this is you know once again a whole squadron thing and I think the recruiting and retention officers need to, to have a significant role in managing this and making sure that we're getting it right. You know, that doesn't mean take it out of the hands of the aerospace education officer for AE things or out of uh, ES ops um, for emergency services. What it's saying is knowing what all those activities are and making sure we're communicating them out and making sure that when people are going to them, that we're getting that feedback to make the program increasingly better. <clears throat> and members, you know, even if they're brand new and know nothing, don't even can't even spell CAP, we need to give them a meaningful activity. You know, it could be, you know, some units I know that they honestly bring food, you know, so someone, you know, helping to uh, serve that food, you know, that they're brand new, you know, they don't know anything else, but hey, could you help out here? And the biggest thing is asking that question, can we need help? Are you willing to help? Can you help me here? If you don't ask the question, you're not going to get the answer you're not going to get the answer yes. And very often somebody will just sit on the sideline and a task will go undone because we didn't ask the question, can you help? So we need to get them, you know, ask the question, get them involved in doing something meaningful. 
here's an example of uh, the activity calendar that I had for the squadron, you know, that I plugged in what was our quarterly focus, what were the quarterly, uh, you know, the squadron events, what were wing events that supported it, and then what our meeting focus was all to, you know, kind of kind of address what that quarterly focus was as, as much as possible. Um, and that's, you know, so we had a plan and everybody received that plan. Every, every member in the unit knew what was going on, when it was going on, where, you know, and then of course, you know, as we, these events came up, we had more details, but it was something that they could pencil in on their calendar at home and they knew what was going on. <clears throat> this is my calendar. I went in, you know, as the region level and I found the calendars for Connecticut, New Jersey and New, New York and Pennsylvania. And I subscribed to them using a Google calendar is a huge savings because I could subscribe to those calendars. And now I see everything that's going on from one vantage point. So Colonel Ninnis. Uh, you know, this is a great example. I, I talk about this all the time is, you know, all of us are busy and all of us have very, very busy and synchronized lives. And, and if you're not planning this kind of thing far enough in advance so your members can, can actually commit the time to it, then what you're saying is I really don't appreciate my members. My, my members' time isn't important to me. And uh, I've seen this a lot in my own wing, you know, where something's only two weeks out and all of a sudden everybody's running around going, oh my God, there's this activity in, in two weeks. And everybody says, could somebody have told us like two months ago? So, you know, it's important that you, you schedule these things in advance so that everybody's on the same page and everybody can can commit their time appropriately. Yeah. And, and these squadron, I mean, this, these calendars, you can build them at the squadron level also. You can build them at the squadron level. The group can aggregate them and present them as one group page along with, you know, the group activities. Um, you know, the wings can, you know, it's possible aggregate, you know, all the different groups and such. I mean, there's, this is doable. This is doable, folks. All right. Colonel Ninnis, was there any questions so far or any comments or any people no. booing in the stands or whatever? <laughs> So far, nothing, uh, no major booing. Uh, just some minor commentary. We got some uh, a good chat going on on the, uh, the page with the presentation, and uh, a couple of questions about uh, you know e-services reports that I've already answered. So no, so far everybody's uh, awfully quiet, which means either everybody's uh, gone to sleep or uh, we're really knocking them dead. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to bet on each either one. Okay, so <laughs> moving on. Here are, uh, we talked about senior members. You know, you're gonna see a lot of similar stuff with cadets, but here are some reasons why cadets are leaving and ways that we may address and try to keep them into the program, right? I started as a cadet. I know some of these pains, you know, I can, I, I can feel them. So let's talk. First of all, number one reason, no longer in CAP. No longer interested in CAP whatever. So this ties back once again to their interests. Why were they interested in the program in the beginning? And what did we fail to address when we recruited them? Right? Unicorns and rainbows, right? We tell them these grand stories. But more importantly, we didn't address some of these needs. So we have a lot of cadets that come into aviation. We find out, we know that one of the most important things that we can do is get them up and flying, that we stand a greater chance to keep them. How well are we doing this? In Rocky Mountain region, I would say is at 65%. I'm thinking other regions are, are in the similar boat. Okay, that means 35% of our cadets have not gone up and had at least one orientation ride. Not sure why, okay? <clears throat> we need to understand that cadets 
are paying members into this program as much as senior members are. And we need to, to treat them respectfully in the same way and, and honor what their interests are. Just as senior members, you know, we want to make that tie in to what their interests are and develop programming around those interests. Not everybody wants to go out and eat snakes in the ES program. Okay, I think they should, but not everybody is interested in that. There are some folks, some places where they would be tremendously happy to pursue the Cyber Patriot program or that they just want to focus on aerospace and fly their brains out. But the only way to find out is ask our members. Colonel Ninnis. Hey, I just want to let you know, Stan, uh, 845. Ah, plenty of time. Plenty of time, plenty of time. Um, That's my job. You know, That's my job, keeping you on task. Yeah, well, we're going to blow the hour. So, but I think this is important enough to do it. And, and once again, if folks have to leave, they have to leave. But they can always come back and catch the rest of the show. <clears throat> okay, so you get a new member in. You know, pretty much at the six-month mark, you need to touch base with them. Find out how it's going. Understand that, you know, there's, you got the intimidation factor, senior member, but maybe it could be a cadet, you know, their flight sergeant, just asking them, you know, these, these questions and get into the habit of finding out if we're meeting member expectations, you know, ask the questions. Um, <laughs> when we go out and recruit, try to try to catch the the 13 year olds right that's probably a, a good age um for bringing members in and we want want to get them in and committed before the fumes take hold perfume and gasoline fumes that's exactly yeah. right my squadron commander uses that phrase all the time you know they get about 16 years old they got their driver's license and now they need they need to go out and drive around and oh gee a car costs money now i gotta get a job and Hey, there's there's girls or boys, and you know that's the perfumes, and that all takes place. And next thing you know, you're gonna lose them. Yep. Okay, I you know I I suffered from that as a cadet, so I definitely know what's what's going on there. I didn't leave the program, but I was definitely distracted. Okay, poor leadership is not just an issue with senior members, right? We had a lot of politics in the senior member program, a lot of favoritism going on, but that's not the only thing that's happening. We got poor leadership, and, and one of the challenges is we're working with a cadet leadership laboratory, and in this leadership laboratory, we are trying to train leaders up uh, to be good leaders, but they make mistakes. Um, and and those mistakes have to be, you know, there has to be an allowance for a certain part of the mistakes. But I know a number of cadets who honestly think that what they see in the movies or hear these war stories from some of these vets, that that's how the program should be run. Um, and, and here's the interesting thing that when you, you know, I had a, a cadet come to an encampment, you know, to be on staff. And, you know, as I was going around the room asking what people hope to achieve at this encampment, he indicated that he wanted to yell at cadets, which was like, wow, that's just uh, kind of blew my mind. Now, when I was younger in the CAP program, I was probably a little harsher than I am now. I'm, I'm more warm and fuzzy than I was then. But what I've come to understand is for some of our cadet members, this is a place that they want to feel safe because for some people, we don't know what their home life is. And if we bring them into a squadron where they're getting yelled at, that may be representative of what they're, what's happening in their home life. And do we really want that? Um, we need to be positively developing our members. So we don't have, a, we don't have time for poor leadership. <clears throat> Part of this is, this poor leadership is, we need to start and close our meetings on time. That um, there has 
have been organized, you know, part of the organization that some units that the, the person opening the door is late. This is causing parents uh, to have to sit around and wait, you know, for their cadet to go in or the meeting runs over time and they're sitting, you know, waiting. This is a frustration point. Um, and we're not respecting each other's um, e each other's time and just not respecting. We're not being courtesy, courteous, right? So we need to make sure that we're opening and closing meetings on time. We also have to set an expectation for both the cadets and the parents that this is a leadership laboratory, that the cadets, it, it's primarily a cadet driven function where they are learning to be our future leaders. And part of that is they don't get it right. And unfortunately our young, you know, cadets are the guinea pigs in this also, right? That they're, they're getting this, but, but what I know, true to my heart is I just saw a wonderful picture of a cadet in Butler, Pennsylvania, leading the charge, a cadet lieutenant colonel, awesome photo. She looked poised and confident and 17 years old is I would have no reservation to say, cadet lieutenant colonel, I need this done and I would be confident that it gets done. So whatever we're doing, we're doing right. But unfortunately, there's some some bumps in the process and not everybody is prepared for those bumps. And we just have to announce them ahead of time. Bump coming, little turbulence, but it will be fine. Making sure that we are spending a lot of time conducting leadership classes for our junior level cadets, teaching them the right way, uh, pointing out that it's not heartbreak ridge all the time. OK, there is a time and place for everything, but to be a, a good, true leader, you need to dial it back a lot and uh, show more respect. The, the function of a leader is to remove obstacles so members can excel, right? Not create obstacles. Another reason that cadets are leaving is they're crazy busy, right? I, Man, I, I cannot believe the number of activities that that our youth are involved in. And CAP is just one of those activities among many other. So how do we take a prominent piece in there? OK, one of the things that we suggest is conduct classes on how to budget their time, right? How to make a good schedule so everything fits and it fits with minimal stress as possible. Um, and I know that, you know, our program brings in some high speed members and, you know, they're the A types that are going out and trying to crush everything, but they also will burn out if we don't teach them how to, to do everything and do it effectively. <clears throat> this is kind of selling, right? So, so we have members that are doing sports. And, you know, because they think that they're going to be playing in the, the NFL, the NBA, the M MLB, um, odds are not in their favor, um, you know, that they're doing band. And, man, I, I wish I was smart enough to do music. I can't, I can't play a tune even on a radio sometimes. Um, you know, and, and music is one of those skills that's a, it's a lifelong skill. But we, what we need to do is really hone in on why CAP is important and why CAP will help them in the years to come. Um, and part of that is understanding where they want to go and really point out how CAP will help them not only get there, but succeed at that point. Sometimes we just need to be more flexible, right? If all your members are involved in extracurricular activities that end, you know, at seven o'clock, but we're holding meetings from six to eight, you're not going to have members. Perhaps we need to move the meeting to 7.30 to nine. Or in some cases, I know squadrons that would hold Saturday morning meetings. 
that they would get together on a Saturday morning. Um, you know, we have to, what, what would our membership do? And there's only one way to find out, ask them, you know, if we're not getting people to come, what could we do different to make sure that it works for them? <clears throat> Sometimes things just change, right? That whether it's a time issue or a travel issue that they're not being able to, to make the meeting. Um, carpooling, right? Maybe it's, uh, you know, they, they moved. They moved a little further out but they don't know who to talk to. So by having those conversations, maybe there's a way that you can arrange carpooling. I, when I was a cadet, we lived 22 miles in Pennsylvania through those windy roads away from the armory. And, you know, it would take a good half hour, 40 minutes to get there and a good half hour, 40 minutes to get home. So we're talking an hour and a half travel coupled with a two hour meeting, you know, on a night and, you know, I had to carpool and, and matter of fact, you know, one of my best friends in civil air patrol, uh, I would spend the night uh, at his house and then take the bus to school with him, you know, the next day and I'd have to bring, you know, so there was arrangements that we made. And, you know, every Tuesday night, I pretty much stayed, you know, at the halfway point, basically. Um, and that just made it a lot easier to kind of weave this in. So you have to think about those possibilities. Did I mention start and end on time? Okay, this is all about um, respectful of other people's uh, time. Okay, I, you know, if you've ever show, shown up for a meeting and everybody else shows up late, and you're just aggravated, you understand the feeling I'm talking about, right? And if you do this consistently, um, something's gonna break and it's usually gonna be a break in membership. Once again, CAP wasn't what they thought it was, you know, everybody's crazy and going in their own directions. They, nobody knows what's going on, okay? <sighs> Once again, starting at the very beginning, sitting down and explaining the expectations of what this uh, what this program is about, what they're hoping to get out of it, okay? And do this prior to them joining. Don't take somebody's money um, if you don't need to, right? It doesn't help, it doesn't help our program. It doesn't help our numbers. I would rather have people that want to be in our program to join. Once again, Encourage them to attend multiple meetings before joining, okay? Make sure that is a good fit. Three to four meetings, they pretty much seen all the different, I mean, not everything, but the, the different flavors of activities. Um, we would hold a, a four meeting rotation where we had uh, emergency services, leadership, aerospace, and character development and PT. And we would rotate that, you know, you basically uh, lead, right? So lead was leadership, emergency services, aerospace, and and development, character development. So or leap, another one. <clears throat> doing a member board, right? Setting expectations right at the beginning, right? Doing an interview. Why do they want to come in? Why do they? What are they hoping to gain, right? Um, you know, it's kind of like a job interview. Right, job interviews two pieces. One, are you a good fit for the organization, and is the organization a good fit for you? Right. So, um, one of the sayings in business is "hire slow, fire fast." Not that we're trying to fire anybody; we're trying to keep them. But we should be slow in, you know, we, there's a push to go out and recruit. This doesn't mean recruit them. You know, take their money, get them into the program. We want to recruit people that are going to stay. And so by taking our time and fully explaining the program, we stand a better chance of getting the people we want who are going to stay in the program and, and do the missions that we're hoping to get done. Huge at a squadron, right? If it looks like school, right, why would you want to do this, right? 
there are a number of, of our youth that want nothing to do with school. Nothing. They don't, you know, sitting in rank and file, listening to a lecture is not their idea of fun. So we should not be doing that in our program. Now, that, that doesn't mean the lecture style is out the window, but as somebody who has gotten a lot smarter on education and how to do training, a lot of what we do can be flipped on itself and, and changed in what we're doing. So making the activities hands-on activities as much as possible, right? You learn a lot by just building. If not, they're at least having fun, right? And that, you know, that's half the battle, right? Let's have fun and we can accidentally learn something on the way. Let me ask this question. How many of you are using the STEM kits? I think there's, what, six different STEM kits out there. How many are you are in the Aerospace Education Excellence Program? And I'm about to, and, and this is one of the things, you know, especially at the wing level, I would run these reports. I would go in and run the report and see how many units in your wing are involved in these programs. And if they're not involved in these programs, why not? These are outstanding, hands-on programs that are free to our membership. All we have to do is ask. All we have to do is sign up and say, we want to do this. Um, great programs. And we, at my unit, we did the rocketry. We did the... Uh, the flight simulator, we got lots of cool mileage out of these different programs. You know, we had a couple, uh, two or three flight simulators running at the same time. Great, great opportunity. I had a blast. And this is not just for cadets, right? These flight simulators, getting a senior member either to mentor a cadet or the senior member pilots, it's a great thing. You know, have a contest, you know, have them just do take off landing at an airport, but jack up the winds and reduce the visibility and, you know, have a contest to see who, who can land it the easiest. Looking for activities. Once again, saying our members are bored. Um, on the cadet programs page, they have a library, a list of activities, leadership activities aerospace activities, all kinds of different tools and activities to make our programs hands-on. And, and there's not a reason why we shouldn't be doing this. And if you're still looking for activities, go to Pinterest, look up aerospace education, and you will be amazed at hands-on activities. Look up leadership activities you will be amazed at all the different activities that are out there that we could be bringing into our programs that are very easy to do. <clears throat> another reason that members leave, um, another obligation comes up, right? They're going to college, they're going into the military, you know, that they've graduated, it's time for them to take a job. What do we do? One of the things, if they're moving away, going to another college, you know, it's sad that they're going to be leaving your unit, but they don't have to leave CAP, right? This is Jamestown, New York, right? This is where I live. And within 50 miles, I have four units that I could tap into. Now, one happens to be in Pennsylvania, one of those other wings, right? But who cares, right? Still in CAP, you know, you, you become a member of the unit. I have options here. I can go just down the road to Jamestown, right? If that's a good fit for me, great. If it's not, I can go up to Dunkirk or I can go down to Warren or I can go over to Erie, right? But eventually I'm gonna find an organization that works out for me. If somebody in your, your organization is not a good fit, pull up the map and say, here, we got these organizations too. We'd hate to lose you, but We'd rather keep you in CAP, and this may this unit may be better suited for you because of the activities they're doing. Okay, help them out. Telecommuting. This this kind of you know I, I don't know if necessarily it works for cadets, but but um, 
you know, definitely for senior members that there's some functions in CAP. Right now, I have not been to a physical meeting in well over a year uh, because I moved from Wyoming to New York. But I'm now serving at the, the region level. I haven't, uh, I haven't joined a local squadron. But I'm yet I'm doing all kinds of tasks at the region level. I'm I'm tremendously busy. My whole day yesterday was finalizing a presentation. Um, but I'm running reports and sending out messages. You know, I'm doing all kinds of cool stuff. And other senior members can do similar things and stay actively involved in the program. <clears throat> doing this transition before the member goes into the military, have them switch from cadet to senior member and do this blue to gray transition and get them into the senior program and, and try to, you know, knock out that level one requirement before they even, you know, get to basic training or their OTS or what have you. Okay. Let's get them involved. Another reason that cadets uh, leave is they just get too old, right? Hate to say it, but you're too old to be in the program because you turned 21. So what we need to do before they even get there is sit down with them and really thoroughly explain the senior member program to them, what options that they have, how they can be integrated into the program. And honestly, I would have them do something other than cadet programs, right? That's just kind of a, a being a glorified cadet at that point in time um, until they've been a senior member for a while or have, you know, kind of gotten older, then cadet programs in my mind is a better, is a good fit, right? Because they, they understand this, but they also have that maturity level instead of trying to jump in and, and take over the program. I would recommend a, a different program uh, as they move on the, on the line. Same thing with age, right? It doesn't necessarily only work if they're joining the military. I went in the military when I was 17, but you know, as they get closer to 21, uh, if they're not, especially if they're not doing the spots award, right? Why don't Why don't we just transition them to you know, with their approval, transition them to senior member, and get them moving on that track, and and get them actively involved in being part of an air crew and other things like that. <sighs> We need to quit referring to the senior member program as the dark side. Okay, that just needs to go away. It's not respectful, right? Maybe humorous, but it's not respectful. Um, and it casts a dispersion on, you know, uh, uh, part of the program that, you know, our membership looks at it with suspicion. There are very rewarding things in the senior member program. I love my time as a cadet, but I equally love my time as a senior member and what I have done to contribute to this nation. And we need to show that type of respect, you know, that we have, you know, and the same thing from the senior members, that we have senior members that want nothing to do with cadets. That's got to go away too, okay? We are one organization. We have members who are paying members that, you know, deserve their respect across the board. So highlight the positive aspects of our senior program. And this is also, you know, kind of talking uh, the Pygmalion effect that, you know, if we say our program sucks, we're going to have a sucky program. If we say we have the best program in the world and we truly believe that, we will have the best program in the world. Um, so we need to stop moaning and groaning and kibitzing and we need to talk positively about our program. And, and I look at it, I see it on cap talk and I see it, I, I go to a national board, I, I go to these meetings and I just hear people moan and groan and, and just whine. Um, we need to get past that. Some members leave because they had a disagreement with another senior member or not, not a senior member, but another CAP member. Um, and so what they don't understand is that sometimes uh, 
enthusiasm doesn't necessarily mean that you're being yelled at, um, you know, or, or that it's personal. So, but on the other hand, we have cadets, I've watched cadets that are out there yelling at people. Um, and some kind of tripped the line from it used to be business to now it's personal. Um, and they just need to be shown the right way. You know, they need to kind of, you know, they get mad. I've watched a number of cadets. They just get so mad because an inspection didn't go well at encampment or, but what they fail to understand is these are learning opportunities, right? These young cadets, they don't mean to screw up. Um, they're learning something new and just not getting it right. So we need to, to kind of look at it differently and teach our more senior cadets, you know, who are doing the yelling that uh, that's not the appropriate. They should be there to be uh, mentors and help these cadets excel. <clears throat> Interesting thing, you know, especially on the, the topic of group dynamics. Group dynamics are, are fascinating things that, um, that you have this idea of forming and uh, storming and norming and performing right the the four phases of group dynamics and and if you don't understand this then when you move from the forming to the storming phase you may take it personally and end up leaving the program but it it happens to all teams that you will have a point where folks kind of get on each other's nerves before they are a, a, a smooth running organization um, so this idea of group dynamics is critical and conflict resolution on how do we resolve conflict effectively. And we need to teach this all the way down to our lowest level members and understand it even at the top of our program, you know, um, you know, especially you got leadership changes. You've just changed the group dynamics. So there, there has to be, you have that honeymoon period and then right after that, you know, you end up going, why is things not working well? Well, understand that it's a natural phase of group dynamics. It'll pass, but you're going to have to do some more communicating. And uh, finally, we need to be alert to conflict in our organization and put a stop to it as soon as possible, getting people to sit down and get doing a lot of hashing out and understanding what the problems are and respecting uh, feelings that are associated with that conflict. I, often we don't respect that, um, but then come to good resolution in the end. Questions, 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 questions. So let me head back over there. Stan, we did pretty well today. Um... Uh, so far, just uh, just about uh, 13 minutes afterwards, so we're doing uh, nice and smooth. Hey, wow, you're scary looking. Um, so we haven't had any questions really. Uh, some folks were uh, talking about mentoring, and they were uh, some commentary as the uh, slides were going by. Uh, in particular, uh, Justin Bear here said it also helps that those cadets approaching aging out see a senior member cadre in their unit that they would be pleased to join. This goes back to having that finger on the pulse of the unit and being aware of the unit climate. Keep the politics in check. Excellent, excellent statement. Ah, uh, let me see. Let me see. I, I'm going to catch up on these. So, okay. Well, I'll, 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 there's a lot of comments. Holy smokes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all your wonderful comments. I'll, uh, I will uh, brief everybody. Um, uh, our next presentation, um, uh, pending some uh, concurrence with uh, my dear Colonel Scrabbit here, will be on the 22nd of March. And uh, we are going to hold that one a little bit later so that the folks on the West Coast don't have to uh, conflict with work so bad. So it'll be at 2100 hours Eastern uh, and a little bit earlier on the West Coast. Um, we're also looking at potentially doing one of these on the weekend so that the folks in Alaska and Hawaii can uh, participate live as well. Uh-oh. Stan, are you got anything more for us tonight? Well, I don't know. I was uh, kind of sifting through the comments real quick, um, unless you didn't see anything. No, nothing really jumped out at me. We were talking, there was some, 
things I went back and forth with some folks in the comments while you were going along, and you know, we talked about mentoring and some things like that. All right. Oh, so you were you were managing that, huh? Mm -hmm. I wasn't just sitting here looking pretty, you know. Okay. Right. I'm just wondering. Okay. Very cool. Well, folks, um, you know, I'm going to go through these comments also, and if I, you know, see anything, um, you know, that I can jump in on too, I will put my comments in there. But one, I want to thank you very much for participating and coming to hang out with us. Um, this is this is important stuff. And I really appreciate uh, that you take time out of your day to, to come join us. And we'll keep going. We'll keep on going. Okay. So um, can you send the link so we can send them to the presentation? Well, um, the Google Plus, that presentation will be there. So um, you can send out that same link, the one that got you here to this presentation. That will be out there and available. You can send folks future for the days ahead and um, they can come here and, and check it out. So very good. All right, folks, I'm going to go review some comments and add some notes if I find them. And let's see. The link to the MailChimp program that I mentioned earlier. So let me pull that up. MailChimp. Very, very simple, MailChimp.com. All one word, MailChimp.com. That will that will get you to the program. Thank and it's you. free for up to 2,000 um, addressees. Yep. Very good. All right. So you asked a bunch of wonderful questions. And uh, James Roth said, I don't see any of the comments, only a couple questions. Um well, if you at the Google Plus, you should see the comments below, and um, you'll see what other people have been asking. So, thank you. It is so. Keep going. Okay. Thank you very much, folks. So, we're going to sign off for now. But once again, thank you, uh, Colonel Ninnis. Do not go too far. Okay. We'll see everybody on the twenty-second of March. Okay, and also the tenth of March. 10th of March, make oh, yeah. sure the word gets out that we are doing a uh, show and tell about the CAP program. Thanks.